Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar session, Tools, Technology, and Solutions for Owners and Operating Facilities. First, I'll go over safety moment, introduce Josh, and then he will begin the presentation on technology, tools, and solutions for owners and operating facilities. We'll have a brief question and answer session after the presentation via the chat button on our website, www.03.solutions. Every registered attendee will receive a copy of today's presentation slides and a link to the recording via email within two business days. We will also post today's webinar recording on our website, along with previously recorded events that you might want to check out in our education library. Today's safety moment is on heat exposure. It's important to pay attention to your body during the warmer months, as you might note that you could be exposing yourself to exhaustion or stroke. Um, and there's some very key things to pay attention to. For instance, if you become faint or dizzy, excessive sweating, uh, your skin becomes cool or pale, if you become nauseous, um, if your pulse is rapid or if you're experiencing muscle cramps, you might have heat exhaustion. Um, and then even more intense and dangerous is heat stroke. And that's a throbbing headache. You're not sweating. Um, your body temperature rises above 103. You're nauseous um, and you've got a rapid strong pulse. In worst case, you may lose consciousness. And that's very important to call 911 and take immediate action. Um, so it's just very important to take, pay attention to your own body during the summer months and this hot weather that most of us experience. Um, and some tips are to wear loose fitting clothing, uh, always wear sunscreen outside, drink plenty of water, always make sure you're hydrated, and then take uh, precaution with certain medications you may be on. You need to always read the label. And then, uh, of utmost importance, never leave anybody in a parked car. Um, and then just always just take it easy. And again, pay attention to what your body is telling you and um, rest and get inside or get some, get in some shade um, and let your body get acclimated to the heat. And with that, I will now introduce our speaker. Josh is the CEO at O3 and the co-chair for CII, AWP, Benchmarking and Performance as well as a technology committee member. He is also a former SVP for product and market strategy for materials management slash RFID software. He holds 12 technology patents and has his BSc in mechanical engineering. Thanks for joining us today, Josh, and sharing some of the tools that our clients use to assist in implementing AWP. At this time, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Tori. I'd like to start by providing just a little bit of background on O3 uh, by sharing some of our sample experience. Uh, O3 is a software as a service a solution built specifically for industrial construction and advanced work packaging and workplace planning. Uh, and we work with both owners and EPCs. And about half of our clients are owners and half are EPCs. And you can see some sample experience here, uh, including some of the largest projects in the world where we have over 3,500 users in the tool on a, a single project across 30 or more contractors, uh, as well as down to some very small projects in the few million TIC range, uh, brownfield projects, small cap at, uh, at existing operating facilities. Uh, so we have experience on some of the world's largest projects and some of the smallest projects and, and everything in between. And O3 got its start focused on uh, owners, uh, but as I mentioned, uh, works with both EPCs and owners. But today we're going to be talking really about the owner side. Uh, to give you a little bit of an understanding of our software solution suite, uh, we have uh, six primary modules or solutions within the, within the tool. Uh, starting in the bottom left with on course, which is our basic uh, training and education management functionality that allows you to drive change management and measure change management on your project as you're introducing new processes like AWP or new tools like O3. Building on that, we have what we call on task, which is our global task management functionality, which allows you to remove the spreadsheets and emails associated with task management and to have a, a collaborative and a centralized global task management tool for your project. Uh, building on that, 
is our on track module, uh, which is modern project management. So this adds things like uh, risk management and issue and decision tracking, scheduling, uh, and uh, the functionality that you need to, to, to manage your projects in a more agile method. So this includes things like uh, Kanban, for example. Building on that further, we get to our on-pace solution, which is uh, really work-face planning. So this is where you build installation work packages, where you release construction work packages, where you progress things in the field, uh, and it's really focused around the work-face planning. Uh, and then building on top of that to our uh, overall complete solution, which is on plan, which encompasses all of the uh, solutions below it. And that's really for advanced work packaging across your entire life cycle of the project, but then also across the entire organization. So on plan builds on the installation work packages and construction work packages that you find in on pace, uh, but it extends that out to actually nine different work packages standard out of the box. So full complete advanced work packaging across the entire life cycle of the project from concept through commissioning. And then the last uh, uh, solution you see in the bottom right is our on tool solution, which is a native iPad app that can be used to collect uh, productivity observations and safety observations uh, in the field. And then that information goes back to our central server where you can do the analytics and, and reporting across productivity and safety information. So what we're going to be talking about today is really owners and owners' role in advanced work packaging and how O3 supports that. And the first thing we want to talk about is the fact that owners are driving adoption of advanced work packaging. And what you see on the screen here are the logos of a, a couple of different owners who are, who are publicly uh, taking a position of supporting and adopting advanced work packaging. And we think it's really important that the owners drive it because without the owner's support, we're not going to see the movement uh, in the industry. And that, that, that's been true. If you look back at the productivity gains over the last 50 or 60 years, it's been very stagnant. Uh, and, and we actually saw something very analogous in safety. And safety was really flat. The safety performance was really flat until owners got involved and started driving the process. And they're able to drive that process by uh, setting requirements and setting standard measurements and incenting and rewarding safer behavior. And by doing so, we saw a significant increase in safety in the industry. And that makes sense because if, if the owners aren't rewarding it and driving it and measuring it, it's very difficult for the contractors to, to make the decision to invest in it because they've got to win the work. Uh, so if you, if you don't, as an owner, uh, measure and care about and reward that behavior, it's difficult to expect the EPCs to, to be able to shift their behavior. And the same applies for productivity. So we need to see that same owner-driven, owner-led movement. And we are seeing that in the industry, which is really exciting. The other piece that I'll mention is when you look at the shift in uh, safety performance, one of the major drivers was this move from leading, uh, uh, from uh, lagging indicators uh, to leading indicators. And what I mean by that is that instead of just looking at catastrophic safety events, we started measuring things like near misses. So a near miss is a leading indicator that you may have unsafe acts or unsafe situations that could lead to uh, a safety issue uh, down the road. And so by moving from these lagging indicators of, of safety instances to leading indicators, we also saw uh, an increase in safety on projects. And we're seeing something similar in the productivity world as well. So today, uh, we've established that we believe owners should be driving AWP and productivity gains. And there are a couple of different ways that we think uh, or we have engaged and believe that owners should engage in AWP. Uh, and those are around lump sum EPC projects. Uh, as well as uh, projects where the owner is taking an active construction manager role, as well as small cap operating uh, site, uh, small cap programs and operating facilities, and then overall corporate AWP programs. So these are the four different ways that O3 has engaged with owners and the four different uh, areas that we suggest owners think about when they think about their AWP program. So starting out, we're going to first look at lump sum EPC engagements. And when we think about the approach that O3 uses in these instances, we summarize that as, as hope is not a strategy, right? So uh, what we find is that owners who are uh, AWP mature and, and, and are driving productivity on their projects, they take a trust but verify approach. So it's not a situation where you say, hey, this is a lump sum project, so I've, I've put all the risk on the contractor. 
you know, the owners that are really driving productivity uh, don't see that as a, as a solution. They acknowledge that their control is more limited in a lump sum environment, uh, but the risk is not, uh, is not so limited, not as limited as people would like to think. At the end of the day, the owner holds a lot of risk, even in a lump sum environment. You have things like change orders, you have schedule risk, you've committed to the market that you're going to have product available at a certain time frame, and if you don't hit that, there are implications associated with that. And so owners who are AWP mature are, are taking this approach of trust but verify, and they're doing that by getting data. And they have to have visibility across the entire life cycle of the project to understand AWP and, and productivity across the entire life cycle of the project, and you do that through data, so not reports. If you have a report, if a contractor is providing a report, that report goes from data to some analysis, to some perspective, to some information that's then presented. By the time you're accessing that, there's a lot of uh, processing that's happened. So well, what we recommend and what O3 supports is instead of having all that processing done on your behalf, collect the pure data and then be able to reach your own conclusions. And the way you get that data is by setting contract data requirements, by clearly defining the fields, format, and frequency that you need to receive data during the project. When we think about the tools that we use in a lump sum EPC engagement, it's really focused on the ADP reporting and analytics, uh, and that's the on-plan functionality that we mentioned earlier. Uh, very strong on the AWP reporting across the entire project lifecycle. Also includes AWP best practice measurements, so the ability to uh, measure leveraging data and understand the health and performance of the ADP program across the lifecycle of the project. And then the data management functionality to know whether or not you're getting the data you need in a complete format and, and in a timely manner to support that reporting and analytics. The other piece in addition to that reporting and analytics is the on-track or agile project management in the early phases of the project. So even in a lump sum EPC environment, the owner still has responsibilities early in the concept phases of the project to set the project up for successful implementation of AWP uh, and the on-track functionality allows owners to uh, measure and plan and, and, and uh, project manage the process of setting that project up for successful uh, AWP. So what do we see in terms of results when you in, uh, leverage AWP and O3 on lump sum engagements? Uh, well, we see a 3%, uh, we've seen a 3% uh, savings in TIC through contingency elimination. So better scoping of projects reduces the uncertainty, reduces the risk, reduces the contingency, also leads to reduction in change orders. Obviously, a significant improvement in owner visibility and then resulting uh, enhancement in schedule and cost certainty. So even in a lump sum environment, you still have schedule and cost risk because the, the project can, uh, can still go over budget. You can still have change orders. You can still have schedule slippage. Uh, so significant savings there, removing uh, uncertainty, providing that visibility to the owner. Some of the lessons that we've learned through this process, owners need to own their data. So while the EPCs tend to have control of the data during the execution of the project, that's at the end of the day, that's the owner's data. It's the owner's project. They're paying for that project, uh, and they should own that data. Uh, and to be responsible stewards for their uh, resources, they should take a leadership position in that and owning that data. That contractual language must include specific data exhibits. So you shouldn't say, the contract shouldn't say, hey, you got to give me AWP data. It needs to be very clear about the fields format and frequency of data that you expect. Uh, trust but verify with ADP best practice measurement. Look, we hire you know, good contractors that have performed for us in the past that we, that we trust, uh, but you want to verify that performance and you want to verify that AWP best practices are in fact being leveraged on the project. And then lastly, early ADP engagement is critical because uh, the ability to influence the project decreases significantly uh, throughout the life cycle of the project, but most drastically right after you execute that contract, right? So the getting the AWP set up from the beginning and early and clear understanding prior to execution of the contract uh, is, is really critical. Otherwise, you get into an area of change orders and, and more complexity. Uh, so moving on to the second engagement type of where owners take an active construction management role in a, in a larger project uh, when we summarize the approach that we recommend there, it's begin with the end in mind. And so what we mean by that is that you want to start from the very beginning thinking about the change management process, understanding that value uh, so that you can build the, the, the uh, use case for AWP on the project, getting executive sponsorship to help you drive change management, building the AWP team 
uh, establishing the AWP process, which means selecting which best practices we're going to be leveraging on this project, and then incorporating the technology, driving adoption, measuring, monitoring, and continuously improving. So that's a change management cycle that we recommend, uh, particularly in, in these construction management projects where owners have a little bit more active role. And so what makes these, th what makes these projects successful? Uh, early engagement. So again, the owner is the only one involved in the beginning of the project and the concept and early phases of the project and setting it up from the ADP from the beginning correctly is critical. Again, ADP contract language, clear definition of what you're going to be doing from advanced work packaging perspective, uh, data-driven reporting. Uh, in this one particular example that I'm mentioning here, O3 was also used to manage what were called transformation teams. And transformation teams were tasked with uh, transformational change, so gold standard project delivery uh, outside of just advanced work packaging. And O3 was actually used to manage uh, the work and, and goals and action plans for those teams, which is something that we recommend getting out of Excel and kind of email-based attempts to manage. Uh, and then ultimately where we want to get is full ADP across the entire project lifecycle. And having the owner in a, uh, in a construction manager role in the project allows you to get there because the owner has much more influence and is more involved. And so it's a little bit easier to kind of drive full use of AWP. When we talk about the tools that we recommend, uh, it's really about full project AWP, which means that on-plan advanced work packaging functionality inside of O3 that includes all of the different work package types. Uh, but this is, you know, it's not only the uh, use of those different work package types and the data-driven reporting, uh, you also get the on-pace work-based planning. So if the owner has a construction manager role, typically the owner's more involved. They have some ability to influence the, technolo the technology that's being used. Uh, they, can, they can, in fact, drive the use of O3 for work-based planning on the project. Uh, and then on track agile project management, particularly early in the project for setting up the project correctly from AAP perspective uh, on task for global task management. So the removal of spreadsheets and emails and text messages for task management uh, and then training management of on course uh, throughout the life cycle of the entire project. So early in the project for training folks on advanced work packaging, training folks on how to use O3, later in the project work phase planning or other aspects. But, but making sure that you have a tool for tracking and that change management throughout the process uh, is really critical. Some of the results that we've seen in a, a, a situation where the owner has an active construction manager role is moving to digital meetings. So powering, moving from a process of, of report-based meetings where people get in a room and look over a PDF report to now let's use data-driven dashboards. Let's power and move to digital meetings. So replacing these PDF contractor reports with real-time data, getting contractors um, involved more earlier on so that you can have better constructability review and feedback into engineering, a great result of advanced work packaging, particularly in a situation where the owner is in a construction manager role, enhanced team goal tracking and planning, so moving from a very uh, manual approach to these uh, transformation teams to, to now being able to leverage a tool specific for establishing goals and tracking and planning against those. A more accurate engineering status tracked by package closeout. So moving away from S-curves and other quantity tracking and getting into package closeout, driving to package closeout uh, so that you can ensure that the downstream uh, resources that need uh, that information are getting all the information they need as opposed to sitting at 99% engineer complete. Um, you, you're able to drive to closeout by packages so that uh, downstream folks in procurement and construction uh, have the information they need. And then better engineering constraint management. So O3 is a, has a constraint engine, uh, very common and very powerful. People typically think of constraints as something that you do in installation work packages and construction. But in fact, constraints apply across all uh, aspects of the project, including engineering. And so having a tool that's built for constraint management and engineering significantly improves uh, the constraint management functionality uh, in the engineering phase of the project. Some of the lessons learned uh, in this process, engaging with ENP early. So uh, typically we find that construction is a little bit quicker uh, to, ad to adopt uh, advanced work packaging, particularly work phase planning. Uh, and I think that's because construction sees a lot of the benefit for, for fairly minimal change, whereas uh, engineering and procurement oftentimes we're asking them to change the way they report or structure the data or the sequence in which they work. And a lot of that benefit is downstream from them. So they see high cost with, with limited benefit to them. 
And so you need to engage early with them, and you have to change that misconception and, and get them to understand that, hey, look at how I can leverage advanced work packaging and agile project management to actually improve the performance of my engineering and procurement teams, not just support construction. Sure, supporting construction is important and, and getting in, you know, constraint-free installation work packages to the field and keeping construction productive is where you see a lot of benefit in AWP. But if you do it correctly and you leverage also agile, you can actually enhance and improve the productivity of engineering and procurement themselves. Uh, support from the top down is critical to change management. So when you're trying to drive change in engineering and procurement, uh, you really need that support from the top down. Uh, keeping data requirements simple and straightforward. So it, you can go down a rabbit hole with data requirements. You can, you can get really, really detailed in your specifications. You can, you can ask for a lot of information you don't need. And it's important here to focus on what do I really need? How do I, how do I, you know, this doesn't have to be the perfect solution. It needs to, it needs to work. I need to make it simple and straightforward so that the, that I actually get the data as opposed to making it really complicated and then maybe I won't even get the data that I need. Uh, communicate wins and challenges openly and often. Uh, so making sure that you get quick wins, build on that momentum, communicate that to the team, particularly when you're trying to get some teams together. Uh, sometimes the, uh, if you have an, a an active role from an owner, contractors might feel like, hey, this, you know, these, these people are telling me what to do here, and I know how to build projects. I don't need this. And so it's important to kind of make it a, a, a team effort and communicate those wins and be open about challenges uh, so that you can work together to resolve those. Uh, and then implement process and technology together. Uh, some folks think, hey, i got to get the process perfectly right, and then we'll talk about technology. And the reality is that that's a fallacy. One, the process is never going to be perfect. So you've got to accept some level of, hey, this is good enough, and we need to, we need to go, and we can improve from there. Uh, but then the other piece is you don't want a situation where you implement a process, and then you have to have stop and, and implement the technology and retrain everyone because you don't want the technology to just be digitization of the manual process. You want the technology to rethink how can we do this process better? If I, if I have technology, how can I make this more automated or eliminate steps? Or what's the, what's the correct solution, not what's a digitized paper solution? So implementing process and technology together allows you to avoid that issue. Uh, so the third owner engagement we'll talk about is uh, brownfield small cap projects at an operating site. And when we talk about the approach here, I'd summarize that as a crawl, walk, run. And what's neat about portfolios at uh, brownfield projects at uh, operating facilities is that you have, uh, you have a continuous uh, revolving door of these projects. It's not that, hey, uh, you know, like a mega project, you, you come together, you start the mega project, you kind of define how you're going to execute it, and then you pretty much stick to that plan for the duration of the mega project. But when you look at operating facilities, you constantly have new small cap projects coming through. So you can take a crawl, walk, run approach. Maybe on the first project, all you do is installation work packages and you don't worry about anything else. And then maybe on the next project, you, you add to that and you introduce real construction work package sequencing and release process. And then maybe on the next project, you introduce test work packages or engineering work packages. But you have this ability to introduce change in incremental pieces uh, because you have these constant starts of projects. So you can kind of build on that momentum. It's important to take advantage of that. Uh, the, the other approach that we, we found really powerful was the ability to measure tool time uh, on a recurring basis across both AWP and non-AWP projects at the same facility. So this gives a really exciting opportunity to look at the productivity uh, impacts in the field for AWP because you have a large project set, so you can get lots of observations at the same facility, so you're controlling for a lot of variables uh, because you're using the same facility, a lot of the same contractors, a lot of the things are the same, uh, but so you can sort of isolate the variable with AWP versus non-AWP and get some really exciting results there. Uh, the last thing is establishing the path to self-sufficiency. Uh, in order to scale AWP within your organization, you have to become self-sufficient. If you require uh, bringing on, uh, you know, uh, 30 people from, from a, you know, a, a consulting organization to be able to perform AWP on a project, that just doesn't scale. There aren't that many third-party uh, subject matter experts. It's got to be something where internally you're building the resources, you're building the competencies, and you can start projects on your own. You can, you know, you can use a train-the-trainer model where you continue to institutionalize that knowledge and train other people. Uh, so building that path to self-sufficiency is critical to scale because operating facilities have lots and lots of projects, and so you, you, you need to lower the barrier of the ability to kind of start those projects in order to, to scale across the organization. 
When we talk about the tools that we use at operating facilities uh, on PACE, the workspace planning and scaffold management functionality, that's obviously a big piece of it because typically we're starting with workspace planning or installation work packages when we talk about using AWP in small cap uh, projects, uh, then going to on plan where you're introducing other package types, it might be engineering or test packages or startup packages, uh, and then the on tools, which is that native iPad app for collecting the tool time and safety observations uh, in the field. Some of the results that we've seen in operating facilities, 18% increase in direct field labor on AWP versus non-AWP projects. And this isn't, you know, one observation on AWP project and another observation on non-AWP project, and look, one was 20% higher. This is thousands and thousands of observations across, you know, across, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 different projects. So this is a statistically significant result here of a, of a big increase in productivity uh, and direct labor uh, in the field. The other thing that we saw was a zero to self-sufficient AWP program in 12 months. And this was the very first time that we did it, so really now this is more like a six-month time frame as we roll this out with other uh, facilities. But with the very first one going from not, uh, you know, not knowing anything about AWP to being self-sufficient in AWP, where able to roll out new projects for O3, train people how to use O3, uh, training other uh, people on, on AWP best practices all on their own, so completely hands-off, uh, which is really exciting. And that 18% increase in direct field labor uh, resulted in about 25% increase in overall productivity, so significant productivity gains. Uh, and then uh, improved planning for access and critical lift tracking, reducing labor costs and risk around access to the work phase. So that was an area, access to the work phase can be a particularly sticky issue at uh, brownfield projects, uh, small cap projects. You've got a lot of different projects in a small area. It's also an operating environment, so access to the work phase can be a, a trickier piece than within a nice kind of clean uh, greenfield project. And so that was another area where we saw uh, in, uh, significant savings. Some of the lessons learned, driving to self-sufficiency is critical. Now you gotta get, you have to have the plan in place to transfer the knowledge and get the team up to be able to do it on their own. Another kind of interesting thing we learned was that change management is actually more difficult at an operating facility. Because if you think about a mega project, you, you, you know, you get a team together, you start a project, and you kind of define, here's how we're going to execute. You don't have a lot of, uh, you don't have the same amount of institutional inertia there that you do at an operating facility. So at an operating facility, you may have a, a team that's been doing it the same way for 30 years, and, and you know, they, they, have, they haven't really made any change, and so now you're introducing a change. Uh, so you have more institutional inertia in that situation than with Greenfield projects, and more change management is necessary. Another thing to keep in mind, uh, corporate support for the initial program launch is key. When you think about the initial rollout on a, on a small cap project, maybe it's a 5 million TIC project, if you ask that project manager to raise their hand and, and take on all the soft costs associated with introducing this change, uh, it's going to be unlikely that a project manager will say, absolutely, put that on my P&L. So you, you really need to take that and think of that as an investment. So if that's coming uh, either at the facility level or ideally at the corporate level, so subsidizing, kind of getting the thing kick-started so that you can get the you can get over that hump and kind of get to that point where, uh, you know, it's an investment towards uh, optimizing overall that entire portfolio or program at that facility. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, and then the nice thing about it is, though, you can leverage that investment because those deliverables and decisions can be shared across projects and facilities. So kind of 80 percent of that initial investment is, is highly reusable. Uh, the last engagement that we're going to talk about today is the corporate ADVP program management. And when we summarize our approach from an AWP program management perspective, we call it right-sizing AWP. And so what we mean by that is that you have to look at your overall portfolio of, of all your different project types, and you want to kind of bucketize those projects into what we call project archetypes. So you're defining these different project archetypes. And so we've talked about kind of three of those here today, right, lump sum versus, you know, kind of more of a construction manager cost reimbursable situation versus small cap projects. And you may have other things within your organization, like maybe in certain uh, situations the owner is very involved from an engineering perspective and certain ones they're not. Uh, but you have different ways of kind of classifying projects within your organization. And so you want to think about that from an AWP perspective, figure out what those buckets are, and then define your AWP approach for each of those buckets, because it's not going to be exactly the same as we've already talked about today. From a program management perspective, uh, O3 works with owners. Uh, we help them to develop an overall corporate program. Some of those services include goals and objectives definition, KPIs and metrics selection, implementation plans and roadmaps, system and process maps, 
Now, all the different pieces that you need to be able to build out that program. And O3 also works with uh, a number of other service providers. So we serve as a program manager and we bring in other service providers or subject matter experts in areas where we think uh, they, can, they can contribute and, and add something uh, in a specific area where, where there's a, a good deal of value associated with their uh, domain expertise. Lastly, I'll mention also program branding and awareness. So change management at a corporate level, uh, investing in some of those soft costs of change uh, are very important. Uh, some of the tools we use in an ADP program management situation, uh, these uh, global uh, action management, the goal and action management. So using on track for deliverable management, approvals management, risk management. Uh, so these, uh, being able to take all of these services and deliverables and, and steps and actions that you need to do both from uh, O3 or our uh, uh, other service providers as well as the owner's responsibilities, uh, being able to manage all those in one system and be able to track all that is really important. Uh, and then on course from a training management perspective, so keeping track of the investment, the awareness, uh, the training associated with the change management. What are the results you see from AAP program management? Well, one is that you can implement AWP. So we have some clients that have taken the position they're going to implement AAP on all projects over 500K in TIC. So we think about the scalability of AWP. If you invest from a program management perspective, you can make AWP cost effective on projects as small as 500K. But if you go to a 500K project and, and you haven't made any investment in AWP, it's going to be very difficult for you to show a positive ROI there because uh, there is some a cost to change. So if you can make that investment at a program level, uh, that allows you to scale down to these very small projects and see a significant ROI. Uh, additional results, rolling out 15 plus projects in, in 18 months, um, launching a corporate ADP library or body of knowledge with all of the information that any project can go to and pull the roles and responsibilities or org charts or policies and procedures or contract language uh, templates or, uh, you know, uh, defined uh, standard policies and procedures or contract language or templates for the work packages. Uh, being able to, to access all that as a project is, is really valuable and, and, and highly reusable. And then lastly, uh, ADP educational video. So this is a, uh, the branding and awareness piece of the soft cost of change management, which is you got to get people on board and you do that. And the best, the best way to do that is by leveraging videos uh, that, that are short and sweet that, that, that demonstrate that this is important to the organization. You can do that by having a, a higher level member of the organization, uh, you know, a VP or, or C-level person uh, in the video saying, hey, we've, we've committed to uh, AWP as, as a uh, CEO level visibility uh, project within our organization. Uh, you can describe what AWP means to the organization and it gets people excited uh, and it helps you with that change management uh, challenge. Some of the lessons that we've learned through AWP program management, keep it simple and build on early wins. So this is a standard kind of idea within change management, but it's important. So you, you gotta get those small wins. You kinda, you gotta build that trust and build on that success. Uh, never underestimate the challenge of change management. Uh, so you're gonna find that as you, as you implement AWP, you, you, AWP is a project execution methodology. So it touches all aspects of the project. It's not limited just to construction. And what that means is you're going to touch a lot of different areas. That means that you're going to you're going to be impacting a lot of different people. So you're going to have a lot of opinions and a lot of people you got to bring on board. So there's a change management challenge there of getting a lot of different folks uh, kind of rowing in the same direction. Uh, awareness and branding are critical. Uh, so you want people to know, hey, this is a real program. This is something that uh, that we've we've chosen to invest in as an organization. Um, the program management role is critical to success. You have to have somebody there that is driving that process and overall is responsible for making that program work. Uh, that's something that O3 does uh, and, and is, is absolutely critical to making a successful implementation at a program level. Equally as important to that is that on the owner side, you have to have a corporate sponsor and a project manager. If you don't have a corporate sponsor that can clear hurdles for you, it's very difficult to drive change. And if you don't have a project manager that can herd the cats, and kind of drive the actions, uh, then it's also very difficult. Uh, as an out, you know, third party O3 can drive some, uh, L, you know, can manage uh, owner resources to some degree, but having someone on the owner side that has been empowered as a project manager uh, really moves you forward and, and allows you to accelerate that process. So now we've gone through and we've talked about four different ways for implementing AWP uh, uh, with an owner and, and four different ways that, that 
uh, O3 has experience with ADP and O3 implementation. So lump sum EPC engagements, uh, active construction management role and mega projects, uh, brownfield small cap operating facilities, and then corporate ADP program management. Now transitioning a little bit to talk about the benefits of having an owner involved. There are lots of benefits to owner involvement, but a couple that I wanted to highlight. One is on the constraint management side. This is an area where people are constantly surprised by how many constraints are owned by the owner. So this idea that the owner can kind of walk away and constraint management is the EPC's responsibility is just not accurate. I mean, we can see the data. We know who owns the constraints, and, and the owners uh, own a lot more than you think. The other thing that I'd like to, to, to mention is that owners are the only one who really care about the total project optimization, not just a portion of that. And that's not to say that EPCs or contractors are, are not good people. They're just they're focused on their aspect of the project. The only one who's over the entire project is the owner. You know, a contractor or a subcontractor, they're going to focus on delivering their aspect of the project. And they're going to deliver it well, uh, and, and they're going to contribute to the overall project. But the only one who's thinking about the overall optimization is the owner. And, and as a result of that, being kind of over the entire project and the only ones who are over the entire project, the owners are in a position to drive that collaboration across the silos. And so owners really have the, the opportunity and, and we think responsibility to help kind of drive that collaboration as well as driving AWP. So owners are the ones that, as an industry, need to be driving advanced work packaging. So if we, we say that we expect the owners to drive AWP, well, what does that mean? It means the owner has to contribute. And how do they contribute? Well, first, they need to clearly define ADP expectations. So they need to get rid of this uncertainty. So one of the challenges in the industry is if you ask 10 people what ADP means to their organization, you get 10 different answers, even within the same organization at times. And so in order to, to remove that uncertainty, owners should clearly define ADP expectations and include that in their contracts, and then you remove all that uncertainty. Secondly, Owners need to reward contractors that invest in AWP during the bidding process. So what's frustrating to see is that some owners will say, hey, ADP is really important to me, and then you'll go through a, a, you know, a bidding process, and you just select the, the uh, least expensive bid, uh, regardless of their uh, ADP maturity or their, their connection or their uh, dedication to advanced work packaging. We've started to see, however, owners now that are saying ADP is a requirement, and, and they're actually rejecting bids that don't come with an ADP plan, and I think that's really great. That's what our industry needs. We need owners to say, hey, ADP is important. Productivity is important. Safety is important. You need to show up with an ADP plan so that we know that you're investing in productivity and safety on these projects. And then lastly, taking a partner approach to provide resources to contractors so that they can level up their ADP maturity. So one approach is to say as an owner, hey, this is what ADP means to me, and, and you need to do this ADP, and this is what I need to see. And the other is, hey, you know, you're not quite there yet from an AP maturity perspective. We aren't either. But, hey, here's where we want to go, and we're willing to work together. Let's partner, and let's help provide some resources. Let's share some of those costs in terms of, 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 of the investment in the education and the, in the introduction of tools and the introduction of change management. Let's work together so we can level up together. And that's going to get us there faster. If owners and contractors are partnering together to kind of level up ADP maturity, the industry will move faster together. So talked a lot about um, how we engage with owners, just summarizing a couple of key takeaways from today. Uh, first, ADP works on all project types, right? So it, you can take a programmatic approach to ADP. It works on small cap, it works on large cap, it works on lump sum, it works on cost reimbursable. So ADP works on all project types. And in order to take advantage of that, you need to define project archetypes and then right size AWP for that type of project. And if you want to move the overall productivity needle within your organization, you have to look at scalable ADP at facilities. If you think about it, when, when you think about your total capital spend, there's a huge percentage of it that's in that base load of small cap projects at existing facilities. You can't just ignore all those projects and expect to move the overall uh, needle for productivity on your overall capital spend. Uh, there's a lot of, of TIC when you, when you put all those small cap projects together. And then don't under underestimate the change management at those facilities because of that institutional inertia, because those facilities have been doing things the same way for a long time, uh, and a lot of people have been in the same position for a long time, you have more institutional inertia than you do in, in large cap uh, projects where your team kind of comes together to execute a new project. Uh, like safety, we believe owners must drive advanced work packaging. If you want to see the same improvements in productivity that we saw in safety, we have to have owners driving it the way that owners were responsible for driving safety. 
In order to drive AWP, owners need to reward AWP investment by contractors. So the contractors that make that investment, uh, you know, include that in your bid evaluation and, and ideally a require AWP plan as part of your bid process. And then owners need to partner with those contractors to level up AWP maturity together so we can move the industry forward together. And then uh, owners should own their data. So we hire good contractors, we trust them to do great work, but it needs to be a trust and verify. And the trust but verify is driven by getting data as opposed to just getting reports. So collect raw data and then perform analysis and understand the true health and state of that project and health and state of AWP on that project uh, on your own. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Tori and see if we have any questions. All right, thank you, Josh, for your presentation. Uh, at this time, we'll moderate any questions you may have via www.03.solutions on our chat feature, and we'll address as many as we have time for. Um, so, Josh, here's a few that came in during your presentation. The first one is, uh, when does it make sense to begin introducing technology in the AWP process? Sure. So, uh First, I would say that AWP is a project execution methodology, not a construction execution methodology. And that means that AWP, uh, is, if, if done in its full capacity, goes across the entire project life cycle from concept through commissioning. So you're starting preparing for successful AWP implementation at the very early phases of the project. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, we're firm believers that you want to introduce technology at the same time as that process. So both, if you're doing full AWP, if you're doing really, if you're really AWP mature, uh, then you want to start both the AWP process and the AWP technology in the very early concept phases of the project. All right. And then another question here, does O3's pricing model scale for small projects or portfolios? Absolutely. Great, great question. Uh, the short answer is, is, is yes. Uh, the... Uh, O3's pricing model is is based off of uh, TIC, so uh, a lot of uh, tools are based on a per user uh, license cost. And one of the things that's really important to O3 is this idea that we want total collaboration. We want to have everybody in the in the project using the tool, leveraging the analytics, and in order to incent that, uh, we do a unlimited users model based off of the TIC of the project, uh, and so. Uh, when we talk about operating facilities, it's based on a TIC of the, of the operating facility, so the, the, the amount of uh, TIC that's being managed uh, at the, at the uh, facility. So if it's a program of projects, it's a sum of that TIC. So it does scale based off of the, uh, the size of project as well as the size of facility, so uh, absolutely. Great, and then one final question here. Is it necessary to include graphical workplace planning for small projects? So graphical workplace planning uh, is this idea that you can use a, a 3D model, a virtual construction model, to scope your installation work packages. So the ability to see the model, click on components in the model, so grab a pipe spool, grab a, you know, uh, different pieces of steel, and build a, a work package out of those. That's an oversimplification, but essentially this idea that you can graphically scope the package. So that's not a requirement uh, in any advanced work packaging situation. So you don't have to be able to do graphical scoping. We have projects that do completely non-graphical scoping of packages, uh, and they're, they're managing um, you, you know, uh, thousands and tens of thousands of work packages. So you can do it uh, without uh, the, the 3D model. The thing about the 3D model is that it, it makes that process faster. So if I can go in and I can visually grab pieces, and then when I grab a component, if the uh, model is properly attributed, I can automatically recognize what type of component that is, and so I can create the work steps or execution tasks for that. I can automatically recognize the associated drawings and pull those in. So if you have a properly attributed model, it can make the process of identifying the scope faster, and then it can automate the creation of, of some of the things like the rules of credit or the uh, drawing associations or the estimated hours. So it, allow, it automates some of that process. Uh, leveraging the data in that model. So while it's not required for any type of packaging, whether it's small cap projects or, or mega projects, uh, it, is, it is helpful and it makes things much faster when the model is properly attributed. What I would say is that what we find is that the models at smaller cap projects 
tend to be uh, less rich than those on large greenfield projects. So new kind of new build large greenfield projects tend to have really nice uh, complete models that allow for a lot of automation. When you get to smaller cap brownfield, brownfield projects, uh, you tend to see a reduction in that um, completeness of the engineering model and therefore a reduction in the value of the graphical work-based planning. So um, I guess the short answer is it's not required, but if the model is properly attributed, it makes things uh, easier and more automated and faster. Okay, great. Well, that looks like all the time we had allotted for today. But again, please contact us if you'd like more information or have other questions. So thanks again, Josh, and thank you to everyone who is able to join today's webinar. You'll receive a recording and the final presentation slide soon. We invite you to join us for our next monthly webinar, What's New in Work Packaging? Contractor Lessons from the Job Site with O3 Project Managers on July 29th. And thank you again for watching today, and we hope you enjoyed it and learned something valuable uh, to take away.